Neil, it's lovely, uh, lovely to meet you, and good, good to get started. I guess a, a good, uh, a good starting point might be starting with the new record. Um, sure. I think, and and talking about it within the context of your other work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, obviously, working with uh, with Jim Scott on it as a as a different producer, it's got quite a contrast from the sort of Steve Lillywhite stuff you were doing before. It seems a bit of a fresh approach. Was that an intentional thing? Yeah, everybody has a. An, an approach um, both sonically and also um, their attitude and vibe in the studio. Actually, the Steve Lillywhite aspect of the last album was quite brief. We added a few songs near the end, and he's a, I mean, he's like a, a little sort of dynamo. You wind him up and watch him go. Um, Jim Scott is a very upbeat guy as well, but he's very, um, very consistent every day and, and just a really good um, vibe and a very good presence in his experience and really organised as well. He's the only person I've ever seen take notes of every single take that's happening in the studio, everything that's done, he can tell you at the end of it what was the good bit. Mm. Oh, you played a really good thing in the second verse and direct your attention to it. It's so valuable, that kind of thing. It's funny hearing that because it seems to me like um, a looser and like you're having more fun with this record. It's like a less pressured, um, exciting... Yeah, pressure. well, I'm glad you, you say that because I think it is less precious. I think there's quite an aspect of arrangement about it, obviously, and it's not... It's not completely raw, but it is also uh, um, not fussy, I don't think, and his approach is not fussy. He, he, he doesn't mix with a computer, he mixes by hand and every pass is a little different and his whole boards is humming and buzzing and like it's... And he's, in that sense he's old school, but he's very much into the spirit of performance. I, I think we, I'm pretty happy with that aspect of the sound. It, it's, it's big and fat, but it's not, it's not overly polished. No, it's, I think it yeah. sounds very contemporary, which is... A, oh, well, that's a, good. A good yeah. Good move, and, and lyrically as well, it seems to be um, one of your more direct records, I'd say, of, of recent times. It's like uh, on a track like Amsterdam, for example, it's mm. almost Beatlesque day in the life kind of <laughs> approach. Would you, would you agree with that, or have I grabbed the wrong Well, it's, a, oh, it's an extremely flattering comparison. I won't, I won't argue with it, but I, but I, um, I think that that song is a little bit unusual for me in that I was relating, albeit in a, in a, not a, chronological order, a series of events that happened to me in Amsterdam and uh, on a day off and so it's a true story and it was just an extremely unusual day and almost everything that we tried to do went wrong in some some fashion uh, and it was kind of confronting. So that uh, that song is a, is a narrative for me and in my terms it's quite a narrative song. Um, so yeah, it's nice to have it in there. Mm. And, and in terms of uh, influence on that as well, it seems to me that the, the place of those travels and things like that have have been a strong influence uh, in, in the same way that maybe on something like Together Alone as well, there's, there's the sense of place. And, mm. and how, how do you feel moving from uh, perhaps a kind of home and something that you're really comfortable with, uh, with this concept of traveling and these different influences on, on the music and, and lyrics as well? Well, you have to take stuff in, don't you, before you can get stuff out. So one of the good things about road testing these songs as we did, and we did a, a, a European tour in particular, but an American tour as well, playing some of the new stuff. And, you know, it's a, it may only be a subtle influence, but the, you can, you know, I even name check a few European cities. So, But those experiences were influencing the lyrics as we went I, along. You can hear that in the vocal takes as well. I think mm. it's a lot more... Um, Performative than I think on some of your recent records as well in terms of like you're, you're really like shouting like a live Yeah, um, well a lot of there was a lot of live vocals on this record, which I'm really happy about um, I, I, I must admit I was impressed when Wilco were in the studio to watch Jeff Tweedy uh, He's mostly sings live takes in the studio uh, Which of course relies on having all your lyrics finished and that's the main problem <laughs> with me half the time. I'm still dabbling but uh you know, that was some degree a, um, a prompt to, for me because you get something from a live take, a live vocal played with the band that is just so ingrained in the, and, and not fussy and, again, not too thought about. Um, and, yeah, I think at least two-thirds of the record is all sung live in, on, with, the, with the rhythm track, so I was really happy. Cool. So this, this was, was it an extension, obviously working with these characters, um, of coming out of the Seven Worlds project? Was that how this album... Some came about because it seems like a yeah, like it, it did follow one from the other, and they informed each other quite well. And well, obviously, working with Jim Scott on both projects, it, it, that was the spur. But um, and maybe we took a little more time with the Crowded House album because Seven Wheels, we had no time to double guess anything. Everyone was just walking around with guitars strapped on. And mm. so logistically, I guess that was a that was a nightmare. How did you go about getting all those people? Uh, in one place or on one record, if, if not. Well, yeah, actually, once everybody was there, I know it's easy for me to say it wasn't a nightmare because I was able to walk around and enjoy it and mm. 
Uh, it was surprisingly smooth, the whole thing, and even though we only had three weeks, well, I, I never in the million years expected to have a double album, but we just couldn't stop people. Everyone just went nuts, and I don't think anybody particularly likes having holidays, yeah. <laughs> from what I can tell. You know, they had a couple of days. In fact, the only day, only hard day we had in the studio was when we had a two-day break over New Year's. It was almost like everyone got really kind of uneasy from having two days off, um, and then the rest of the time they were just going for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and and it's, then, it's exciting to watch the, those those characters. Obviously, there's uh, such a prestigious lineup of uh, lineup of people. Were there any like ego clashes or people unsure of which role they should be playing within the band? Because I guess that's hard enough when you're looking in a three or four piece band. Mm. But when you're when you're incorporating on something on a larger scale, was that a, was that a challenge? Oh no, it was. The, I don't think ego was a problem. I think everybody realised that we had uh, to let. Um, let things, situations develop. There wasn't time to have ego problems, really. Things had to be, had to crack on. And uh, there was interesting moments, difficult moments, you know, where people were, weren't able to get a particular track. You know, you'd, you'd draft in one of these, uh, one drummer, and um, it wasn't, some song wouldn't suit him, and mm -hmm. he'd have to abandon it, and you'd bring somebody else in. It was actually a really lovely environment in that regards because you could actually be quite blunt. Right, uh, and not no one. No, Ed, that's no one, good. <laughs> no, it's not working. Sorry, um, and try the you know bring in Glenn or bring in Liam yeah. or Elroy, my, our youngest son, ended up playing on a f couple of songs. He's, he's drumming with Cut Off Your Hands, isn't he? Well, he was, and he that's no longer now. He's actually coming. He's drumming with Conan Morrison, oh, good. and he's coming out on the tour with us. So. Which is a nice little accidental upshot. Well, it's an, it seems like a nice thing with you. I was like, going to say, like, um, from uh, obviously you joining Split Ends and then having Liam playing with you with Crowded House mm. and, and the way it's moved through, it seems like a nice, uh, supportive family thing. Very much, yeah. And uh, we're just blessed, I think, that um, it's not a matter of whether our kids think we're cool, it's just a matter of there's a very easy interaction between us and Liam and Elroy and their friends and there's, um, you know, we're enjoying the company of Liam's friends um, at the moment and, and, and Elroy's too and it, it makes, I'm very optimistic and hopeful about the the, the, the young generation mm, having, because totally. they all seem really smart and really switched on. Definitely and making amazing. Really creative and uh, so it's inspiring for me, you know, and I'm, it's given me a real burst of energy. And so th thinking back, does, like, can you, uh, can you remember the mindset that you were in when you were asked to join your brother's band originally and, and do you think there are parallels in that? Is that, is that something you empathise with or is there challenges in that? Um, I, 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 was Le I was Elroy's age when I joined Split Ends, maybe even a little bit younger, so I can, I can remember back and uh, there's a, you know, see this certain excitement level about entering the arena at that point, doing gigs. You know, every gig seems incredibly um, profound. Um, yeah, so it's really nice to watch it and see it through their eyes again. But, um, God, it's a long time ago now. I was in London though when I was nine. Just I joined the band when I was nineteen, and when you're in New Zealand and you look at, at England, all the music we loved came from here. You have really rose-tinted spectacles, you know. And I remember I went straight from the airport, um, literally to Easy Hire in in Chalk Farm. Mm -hmm. I think it's John, probably John Henry's now or something. Yeah, yeah. And you know, which at the time was a pretty grimy old rehearsal studio, no. <laughs> and no, <laughs> nobody was there when I got there. So it was just this uh, one of the guys that was making, you know, sitting there with a cup of tea, and it was a pretty. Um, I mean, it was great. I wasn't, I wasn't disappointed in the least. But but it was when I think about it now, it was a pretty, um, pretty earthy introduction to uh, to to England. You know, and was that? Uh, did you join uh, before or after you were touring with Roxy M Music? The band was. Around just the after that, time. yeah, um, they'd made an album with Phil Manzanera, mm -hmm. um, which was just before I joined. I joined probably for the tour that was supporting that. Mm -hmm. um, and very soon after I joined, we made the album Just With Mia, which was with Jeff Emmerich. Mm -hmm. And so did you find that the influence of those characters uh, uh, something philosophically? Because you, you changed their, their direction quite quite radically, or, or have been... Uh, have been praised for doing that. Um, well, eventually. I mean, not... And it was only... It was a convergence, really, because it was partly my the fact that my songs were kind of simple pop songs, but the band, having gone through a period of willful indulgence and, and ex in extreme image and the music too, there was a kind of a desire to simplify and strip away and actually um, 
I guess there was an influence too, even though a lot we didn't like a lot of the music that came out of punk, there was something in the ethos that we did like. Mm. And we realised that, um, you know, there was something to be said not um, over-intellectualising any part of what we did and, and trying to connect with people on a much more visceral level. So we were ready to, to, to be simple and my songs happened to come along and suit the time. So, mm. yeah. That's, that's cool because it, it strikes me. One of the things that, um, that I, I really admire about you throughout your career is the... Uh, uh, persistence and compulsion to kind of carry on working and, and producing. I mean, even with the first Cry of the House record, it seems like the label didn't really pick it up until maybe the, the third or fourth single. And, no, and, yeah, it was six, six months at least before anyone took any notice of that. Mm -hmm. It was in the bargain bins back home in New Zealand at the same time it was, it was just about to go top 10 in America, so, yeah. um, which is very common in New Zealand. People in New Zealand don't generally pick up on things until someone from overseas says it's all right. Really, really. Because it seems, it, from the outside, and this might be the UK rose-tinted yeah. rose spectacles, it seems like such a supportive, nurturing scene. Uh, I think the scene is now, especially now, within the musicians, and much more so than it used to be. It used to be very um, fractured and very on, a lot of enclaves and everyone was a little bit, dis, you know, to keep the distance. But now there is actually quite a supportive network of musicians, I think, and a lot more interaction. You know, witness the Barb record that, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Liam was involved with, uh, like that sort of thing. I don't think that used to happen nearly as much. And, uh, and there's actually, I think, some extraordinary music coming out of New Zealand. But to be honest, 95% of it wouldn't be above the radar in New Zealand at all. The yeah. industry there wouldn't recognise it. The only things that get, you know, actually Liam's had a pretty nice run over there and it, it took a while. But generally speaking, things are very difficult for people to get noticed in New Zealand. They usually have to get noticed somewhere else first. Mm. Right, right. It's a bit like uh, American acts coming over to the UK as well. To, if they're if they're a band, then they yeah. they try and they try and do that and and vice um, versa. I think yeah, people take more notice when it's from somewhere else. Mm. I don't know why that is. <laughs> and, um, the exotic, I guess. Yeah. yeah.